Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second public hearing on broadband consumer labels. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm happy to welcome you to the Federal, Federal Communication Commission's, uh, again, second public hearing on broadband labels. Earlier this year, the FCC proposed to require broadband providers to display easy to understand labels describing their services and their prices. To be truly useful to consumers, these labels must be simple, accurate, and user-friendly. We need feedback from broadband customers to ensure the labels we require meet that standard. And that's why I'm so pleased that we are gathering here today to hear from customers, academic experts, and consumer advocates. Anyone who has shopped around for broadband service knows that information and introductory rates long-term cost, speeds, and other technical characteristics can be hard to find. And even when the data is easy to access, it may not be presented in a way that's easy to understand. Congress has recognized the need for clearer cus uh, customer information and directed us to require broadband labels as part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That legislation has given us a firm grounding to start from. Labels the commission approved, of course, in, 2019, uh, in 2016 for a public notice, but we still, of course, need your help. We're working to resolve questions like one, whether broadband services and the way consumers use them have significantly changed since 2016 in ways that call for revisions to the format or content of the proposed labels. Second, where the labels should be displayed to best inform consumers. Third, how the commission should ensure label accuracy. And fourth, the appropriate time frame for the commission to require broadband providers to meet the labeling requirements and display the relevant information to consumers. I'm truly looking forward to your feedback on those questions and more that you think will help make the forthcoming broadband labels as effective as possible. If we get this right, these broadband nutrition labels will help Americans compare prices and service offerings, making it easier for them to find the right package and the best deal for them and their household. Arming consumers with better information will also promote greater innovation, more competition, and of course, lower prices. That's a win for the entire broadband ecosystem. And with that goal in mind, I, of course, want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today, the commission staff for their hard work in setting us up, and, of course, for you for joining us. I look forward to the insightful discussion. Would now like to turn it over to Alejandro Rourke. Alejandro has recently joined the commission as our chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. He serves as a member of the commission's cross-agency task force on preventing digital discrimination as well. Over to you, Alejandro. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Starks, and, and thank you for being here with us today and, and, and sharing your insight. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alejandro Rourke, and I am chief of the, of the commission's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. I'd like to welcome everybody to our second in a series of broadband label hearings. Our goal with this series really is to assess how consumers evaluate internet service plans today, and specifically whether current disclosures about price and speed provide households with the information that they need to make informed decisions. Like I mentioned, this is the second, uh, I said the second hearing in our series. So if you're joining us for the first time, during our first hearing uh, that we held last month, we heard from consumer advocates, industry representatives, and others on how providers are currently informing customers about their broadband offerings, and I invite you all to uh, review that footage uh, by visiting fcc.gov forward slash broadband labels. As a reminder, I'd like to underscore that what we learn uh, through the course of these hearings will become a part of the record and further inform the rulemaking process the commission initiated in January. Thank you again to everyone uh, who tuned in last time or provided questions uh, via our broadband labels hearing at fcc.gov email or lent their voice by participating in this dialogue. As a reminder, to the public and to anyone tuning in, we invite you to submit questions for our panelists during the hearing directly by using uh, broadband labels hearing at fcc.gov. Feel free to shoot us an email. Our team will be monitoring that inbox and we'll work to get your questions to our panelists or address them as a part of future hearings. 
So with that, I like to just begin and, and say, you know, as we work to ensure the broadband, that any kind of broadband label that is created um, is responsive to the real needs of consumers, today's hearing will begin with a roundtable discussion with broadband consumers from across the country who recently had a personal experience navigating the broadband purchasing process and its potential pain points. So here with us today, I am happy to welcome uh, Chet Mehta from Texas, Alan Patton from Georgia, Jackie Georgie from Florida, Adaro Allison from Arizona, and Alan Smith from New York. Thank you all very much for taking the time to join us today. Um, so like I mentioned, you know, all of you have had a recent experience uh, shopping for, for broadband. And I'd love, and I, I wonder if, if Chet, you wouldn't mind getting us started and maybe sharing a little bit about uh, where you're from, what your household looks like, and your recent experience. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I'm Chet Mehta. I'm from Austin, Texas. Uh, we have typically uh, three people in our household, though during the pandemic we had four. My son moved in with us during that time. Um, and and uh, both my wife and I and my, uh, and my son, we work from home, had to work from home. In our jobs, we actually work with a very globally uh, diverse team. So the internet is quite critical for us to not only talk to our colleagues, but even get our job done. Uh, and then over the years, the internet has, you know, become quite, uh, uh, you know, reliant on in the sense that my landline, my, my television, my home security system, even my door locks rely on the internet today uh, in, in terms of being able to, you know, utilize them. Uh, the pandemic, of course, put an increased uh, demand on the internet uh, because we were able to uh, you know, not do education without it, uh, needed to, you know, if you needed to apply for uh, unemployment or even get city services, like obtaining a permit or, or getting a vaccine appointment uh, or even seeing family and friends that could only be done through the internet. So that's, you know, some background on, on why, uh, about myself and, and the need for internet. I appreciate that. Thanks, Chet. And it looks like the weather in Texas is beautiful. Yes, right now it is. Based on that palm tree in the background. <laughs> yeah. Um, Adaro, I'd love to kind of go to you. You're you're in Texas, right? And I think Arizona. you've all. Uh, sorry, what you say? Arizona. Arizona. That's right, Arizona. Um, <laughs> would love to hear about your recent experience. Well, um, my recent experience had more to do with uh, staying connected with uh, students and family. Um, my mother is in an independent uh, living community. And uh, it became apparent as soon as they locked everything down that internet access was only in one corner of the lobby and nobody was allowed to sit in the lobby. They moved all the chairs and, and you know, how do you stay in touch with someone when you, you really can't see each other? Um, you know, she had, she had her smartphone in her room, but she didn't really know how to use the, the camera on that yet. We had her birthday party planned and had to move it from a restaurant to Zoom. And the staff was kind enough to bring a laptop and take her to the office and sit her down with a laptop where she could squint at everybody on the screen. Um, you know, so that and, and then purchasing for my home, trying to compare uh, plans is, has been chaotic. Uh, you know, DSL to cable, what is M compared to MBPS? How do I know how fast that is? How do I know I can do my work? No, I appreciate that. And I think that we've all uh, been there. My mom had an internet. My mom really understood, I think, the value of, of having consistent at-home broadband connection during the pandemic. And I think just helping her navigate all the different deals was definitely an experience um, that required kind of multimodal communication, you know, both online and on the phone. And so I, I definitely hear where, where you're coming from on that. Um, Alan Patton from Georgia, uh, welcome. Uh, do you mind sharing a little bit about your background and uh, your recent experience? We can't hear you, Alan. There you go, sorry. I knew <laughs> I was gonna do that. I'm Alan Patton. I live in Peachtree City, Georgia. Uh, I am retired, both my wife and I are retired uh, just two years ago. Um, our household is set up so that everything is run through the internet. I did that some time ago to, to consolidate costs and also to provide better choices for things like TV. Um, but in the process of doing that, I've also 
had some difficulty working with my current provider to eliminate some of the services, especially when they said, oh, but we can provide you this or we can provide you that. We got into a tussle about, about what the true cost was going to be for having just internet. And it took, it took a while to work with that. They kept trying to add additional accessories and services to the bill. They kept quoting me a price and I constantly had to add them, is that contract price? And so uh, I uh, finally got him uh, cornered to where what the full price was, but it took a long time to get there in the conversation. That is something you cannot find with any of the providers, what the base price is for a service. It always has to be bundles and discounts and, and contracts and so on and so forth. We all know that. So that was uh, one thing that got me to looking at how do I compare their prices with the others. And like Adaro said, is it's, it's nearly impossible to do that because none of them will provide that, none of them publish it. And so you don't know what you're going to get because we all know these discounts, uh, these promotions and so on only last so long and all of a sudden the pro price jumps on you unless you go back and renegotiate. So that was my uh, extent. Now, we also had, an, had to have internet for, uh, my daughter had moved in temporarily as they were building a new house and her family moved in and they all had their own equipment. They had their own services that they wanted to have. We provided all of that on the internet connection that we had. So that's became quite critical at that time, point in time. Okay, so that's what uh, our experience has been. Oh, yes, we also use, use it for uh, Wi-Fi calling on our cell phones because our cell phone service here is a little spotty sometimes. And we found that going through the Wi-Fi, it's a much clearer, clearer tone uh, and it's consistent. Great, thank you, Alan. You know, mm -hmm. Jackie, you know, Alan mentioned a couple of things about how his household was impacted during the pandemic. And I know that um, you talked about that during the, the, the pandemic, you were really looking for a less expensive broadband service. Um, and you actually were able to uh, get some relief as a part of the emergency broadband benefit. Um, would love to hear a little bit about your household, your experience, um, and, and how you kind of work to make those decisions in real time. Okay, well, I'm Jackie Georgie, and I live in the Florida Panhandle, which is subject to weather issues. Um, so I have been very connected to the internet since, well, for a long time. Um, and it became very important to me here because this was the way during the pandemic that I could shop, I could have doctor's appointments. I don't drive and I'm older. So, you know, there were a lot of issues for me. But my real, I had qualified for the EBB program to get the $50 a month taken off my internet. And that program was ending. And my real income between the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2022 went down. And I was also faced with the, the rising costs. So I was very concerned about having an internet service that I could continue to have because I didn't know if I would be eligible for the new $30 a month. And I found it very difficult to find things. First, I had to find out what's the minimum service I can do to run the Wi-Fi stuff I have at home to watch my TV, to be on my computer because I work part-time on my computer. Um, with my phone, I have a couple of, of Echo Dot set up for music and fun stuff. Um, so the first thing I did was I went to look to see what's the minimum I can have because then I can determine if I can take a, a different plan from my current provider or if I need to look at a plan from someone else and you know, is the plan going to be through my telephone or is it through my cell phone or is it satellite or what's going on? And I found it really difficult to answer my primary question, which was how, what is the minimum amount of, of data I have that the MBS part um, in order to run everything so I know where I can go. And it took me a long time to find that. And I did eventually find it. And basically I needed what I had. I could not go to a lower plan. So then I went trying to look for a, a same plan, less money. And basically I could not find any provider outside of the one I was using who would provide the level of service I wanted. 
which was really frustrating. And it, but it was hard to tell what they actually provided because they don't tell you. They don't actually tell you if it's satellite, if it's through your cell phone, you know, is it like a 4G service? <laughs> what is it? They don't tell you these things. Um, ultimately, I went with, I signed a contract with my current provider to get my, my costs down. So I'm locked into a, a one-year contract. And I did ultimately qualify for the new benefit, which is $30 a month. Um, but without actually lowering my monthly plan, I still would have been paying significantly more. So that's kind of my story. Got it. Thank you so much for sharing, Jackie. Mm -hmm. um, Alan, I, Alan Smith from New York. I know that you actually had um, more, you really kind of took it to the streets and, and, and really went out there to comparison shop, which I think some of us don't really have the, the bandwidth to do. Um, and you actually subscribe to various different services. I'd love to hear about a little bit more about your household, uh, how many providers are available in your area and how you actually kind of took on this experiment of figuring out uh, what service best uh, would meet your household needs at the best price. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm Alan Smith. I am in Brooklyn, New York, which is a very, uh, at least, nominally a very broadband rich environment. There are lots of different opportunities for us to be connected here. Um, when my household of three people, when the pandemic started and we were all working from home, uh, we have multiple educators in the house. So we were uh, basically discovering that the kind of constant and engaged video streaming that we're all doing right now was incredibly important to our livelihoods and our ability to continue to do work. So I think I am in similar to a lot of people we've already talked to in the sense like Chet, like Alan, P in Georgia, um, my house is pretty wired. And it was the realization that that wired connection was not dependable. Um, and that in fact would go out for hours at a time uh, regularly during the course of a day that made me realize that there was other things involved in my broadband besides just how blazingly fast my megabits per second upload and download speeds were. Um, so yeah, as, as you mentioned, the only way for me to test whether or not other programs or other providers would be better than the one that I started out the pandemic with was to go out and subscribe to them. Uh, and they'd have to send somebody out to the house and they'd have to drill another hole in the wall of my uh, <laughs> apartment and put another wire through and only through sort of repeated attempts did I find one that wasn't dropping out multiple times over the course of the day. And it was actually the fourth of, it's always the last place you check, right? It was the fourth place that I went. Um, each one I should mention uh, more expensive than the last. So grading up in how much it was costing me, I'm privileged enough, lucky enough to be able to just kind of throw money at this problem until I got an ISP that could do what I wanted. Um, but it took four tries to find something that was regularly, dependably, all day, every day, able to keep a connection open. Wow. Um, that is, I mean, I'm glad that you had the time to do that and we're able to kind of bring people in because oftentimes when we have to kind of make that appointment to get your internet installed, you have to commit. You have to commit to that day and that time to be home. Um, yeah, so, and you and you have to kind of go through the process of canceling the last one. You have to kind of keep your. It's like a you have to keep a spreadsheet almost of which wh where am I still paying? What's still open? What are my connections? Where do they still exist? Is the new one going to be able to use my old router? It, it's not a simple shopping process for sure. Um, a lot of a lot of ins and outs. I appreciate that. You know, with Daryl, I'd love to come back to you. You know, and 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 specifically, I think to get a general feel of like, you know, as, as, as someone um, who is shopping for, for broadband, you know, what, what mattered most to you? You know, was it, was it um, at the price? Was it the speed? Were there other factors? Like how were you, you kind of alluded to it in, in your opening remarks, but you know, what really were you paying attention to as you were comparison shopping? Well, I'm always looking for the speed so that things don't freeze in the middle of downloads. Um, whether there are uh, videos that I'm watching, television shows or Zoom calls, which I spend a lot of time on, I don't like it when things freeze in the middle. It's, it's just frustrating. Uh, so I'm looking for that. And then I'm also looking for consistency. Uh, the 
I've been on DSL for several years, but I wasn't on Zoom at home. I was at the office. Once I got home, I, it became evident that somebody somewhere was guessing who was home and who wasn't home. And they were just, oh, let's just drop this service. There's nothing there. And I could tell because I would run a speed check and I'd get something like two. And it's like, I, I'm supposed to have 15. Why do I have two? And then by the time I called them, they'd say, oh yeah, it's at 16. That's where it's supposed to be. It's like, yeah, but it wasn't. And you know, so <laughs> that's kind of frustrating. So then I've been comparing that, the DSL, with cable and I haven't shifted yet, um, but I'm going to shift probably to a much more expensive plan. But if I do it before the end of this month, I get it for only $10 more than I'm already paying for three years before they jump the price. And I get much faster. So that's and so kind I'm of hearing that that means that if it's a, there's a three year commitment, so you're signing a contract for three years. I will have to sign a contract for three years but at least it will be consistent service. Got it. Thanks, Adaro. So Alan Patton, I'd love to come back to you because it sounds like, you know, is there anything that you found specifically kind of uh, frustrating or you talked about it being time consuming or confusing about shopping for broadband? You know, I think when we, it would be, how did you go about comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges? Did it feel like there was consistency in the information that you were able to access to help you make a decision? To be honest, I didn't get that far to making a decision to switch. And the reason why is because it was too difficult to get the information necessary. There were three things I was looking for. One of them was price, actually four things. Uh, one was price, two was the speed, Three was what technology are they deploying because of the very thing that Adair is talking about is you don't want DSL. If you can keep from it, there's other technologies that, that are available that are coming up like uh, fixed wireless that I know about, but those things are susceptible to things like weather, mm -hmm. like what we just had this week. Uh, so I am interested in what's the foundation for the net internet. And the third thing is, and Alan brought this up, Everybody's brought this up, and that is, I want consistency in delivery of the of the service. I, if I'm paying for 100 MIPS, I want 100 MIPS. Period. If I'm and I'm also paying for a, a reasonable uptime. And so when I was looking at this one service that I was considering, because it was a relatively new one in our neighborhood, I, I the one thing I didn't know, I didn't know too much about them, made me a little worried if I was to switch. And then I came across an article about a month or two later in the paper that talked about this particular provider. There were a lot of complaints in the, in the town next, next to us because certain neighborhoods were, had been out of internet for 10 days. I cannot imagine being out with 10, for 10 days. That just doesn't make any sense to me. So that's very critical to know. Um, yeah. So it has to do with, are you getting what you paid for? And, you, and do you have a high reasonable availability? You can't expect 100%, but you should be able to expect something pretty consistent. Yeah. Yeah, I, thank you for that. You know, and, and as I've, we're kind of hearing your personal experiences, I'd love to go back to um, the other Alan from, from, from Alan Smith from, from New York. And this idea of consistently kind of keeps coming up. And so as someone that really did you know, the nuts and bolts deep dive into kind of comparing plans. Um, what does consistency kind of mean to you? Does that mean that, you know, oftentimes marketing language says up to a hundred speeds, but you know, it sounds like Adero's experience was, well, how often will I have up to the speed that I signed up for? Um, and how did that kind of play into your thought process? So how do you define, I think, consistency um, within your shopping experience? Yeah, um, for me, it was very clear. It was sort of a, a binary thing, which was, was my webinar that I was leading going to freeze up sometime during the hour? <laughs> so consistency was just whatever connection speed I needed to keep that open. And I'm not an engineer. And so the number of, you know, like I could do speed tests and I'd look at speed tests and I'd try to parse what that meant, but I'd still get these like internet is unstable moments, even after, 
allegedly having a clear and open connection of many hundreds of megabits per second. So it, it broke down to me of it, it. The answer to your question is experiential. If, if the thing that I was trying to get to do wasn't working, then it didn't count. <laughs> uh, and so I would call up, you know, customer service and I'd have these conversations and I'd say, would it be better if I was subscribing to your more premium package? You know, can you, can you tell me if I, if I jumped from 300 megabits per second to a gigabit, would it be, would it be more consistent? Or is there any way to kind of deal with that? And they, they, uh, bless them, the person answering the phones at any of these ISPs didn't have that kind of information on hand or wouldn't give it to me. So as a shopper, I, I was asking them for something that felt ephemeral and that no one had a metric for, <laughs> uh, which is just like, can you guarantee that I can do the thing that I'm being paid to do over the course of the next three hours? And, and I, I couldn't do that. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. So Jackie, you know, I'd love to kind of hear, you know, we talked about the information that's useful, but it, was there any information um, throughout your shopping experience that maybe broadband providers have given you that felt wasn't very important to your decision making? For, in, for instance, like, did they stress some sort of specific capability of the service that you didn't really care about or didn't really understand? Um, are there things like broadband providers, uh, things that they describe that are particularly kind of difficult to understand or more technical things? You guys are all talking about latency and upload speeds and download speeds. And I can tell you, you're way ahead of the game for me. I've never done a speed test. So you guys are much more in tune um, to, I think, those technical terms, but would love to hear you know, about you um, and your shopping experience to kind of see how much of that information was useful um, and maybe what, what, what information was, was not very useful. Um, for me, to a large extent, things like latency and all is not particularly useful. I knew once I found out that if I ran everything that all my Wi-Fi stuff at once um, was telling me I needed the 150 um, megabits. And, you know, so the services were saying up to 150. And, and I've had this one for five years now. And what they don't tell you and it's the problem Alan ran into and, and Adaro ran into is that up to 150 does not mean it's actually, it's never made it to 150 here. It's not consistent. And that was the one thing I couldn't find that I would have liked to find because I can make decisions about what I'm running when if I understand what's happening as far as consistency goes. Um, but a lot of the more technical stuff with latency and everything, I, maybe I should care about it, but I didn't. I really only cared, can I run my equipment reliably at a cost I can afford? Um, yeah, thank you. So Chet, I'd love to go to you and, and same question. You know, What information did you find that was useful? Maybe information that wasn't useful? And I know that um, we were able to share with you guys the draft broadband labels from 2015 and 2016 to get a reaction. Would love to hear about uh, your thoughts on the information that was presented and whether you think that would have improved your shopping experience. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Uh, I did look over the uh, labels that you know are, are under consideration. A uh, couple of things I want to mention. I, I was fortunate, I'm fortunate enough in Austin where there is a fair amount of selection of uh, providers. And one of the providers actually leases services to another one. So they compete with each other and the service quality doesn't change, but the price is, you know, held stable. Uh, the thing that I, and, and, and so, you know, service, I, I have come to rely on, on this provider. Uh, and honestly, the way I found out that they're good is not by getting information from them, but talking to my neighbors and looking at the next door app and, and finding out how, how my neighbors are faring with these providers. And that's how I selected the one who I have. Um, as far as the label is concerned, uh, the thing I think about, and, and you know, I'm, I, am a, I have an IT background, so I understand you know, megabits per second and latency and all that stuff. But if I look at people around me, my neighbors, none of them, you know, understandably, you know, follow any of this stuff. And, and I was thinking about, you know, we call this a nutritional label, and it's actually a good comparison, because the idea is to present facts in a way where a, a consumer can actually digest this. And if I look at, you know, a, con a nutritional label as it stands right now, you know, it might say calories, or it might say uh, 
how much sugar is in, in, in you know, something that you're eating. But what's really important is there is a number next to it that says this is the percentage of daily recommended, you know, that, that the, uh, the, you know, that's how the label is based on. And that percentage is really important for me because I don't know how much sugar I should be eating in a day or how many calories are enough, but that percent number tells me a lot. So similarly, in the discussions that we were having about availability, uh, you know, it being there when you need it, uh, it's almost like you need some way to be able to measure that. Uh, and that comparison point is not there in, in the label as I see it right now. Uh, there's also things like, you know, there's a section on network management that even being an IT guy, I don't know anything about what that means, which I find quite fascinating. So those are the two things that popped out on, to me when I was looking at this. No, thank you for that. So again, it, it really sounds like consistency, right? How often can I expect to receive at what speed, you know, the advertised speed that I signed up for, right? Okay. You know, so Daryl would love your thoughts on, you know, we, we, we keep talking about re, uh, the reliability of, of the speed that you um, signed up for. Um, and also I think um, it's relationship to the price, right? So would some all, some sort of all-in price disclosure that identifies the total cost of the service, maybe including taxes and fees and, and surcharges, be helpful? What about equipment fees? What about uh, leasing agreements? You know, how would that information upfront be helpful to you in making that, uh, that purchase decision? I think that would be extremely helpful. Um, I recently, I had an equipment problem and I called and they said, okay, we'll send you a new modem and you ship back the old modem. They're gonna put $15 on your bill, but they'll take that off. So I sent back the old modem and my bill jumped significantly. It almost doubled. And I called them and they said, oh, well, we prorated the modem use. So you got part of that month and all of this month. So that's more than $15. And then it stayed on there. And I said, and why is it still on there for the next bill? Well, you have a lease. It's like, well, I didn't have a lease before. I had your modem, you told me to give it back and you would replace it. And you didn't tell me you were adding a charge. So, you know, they don't tell you all of the details. They, they intentionally, I think, avoid telling you all of the details. And then when you read the bill, you can't tell what you've been charged for because I could clearly see here's my usual charge and here's another 39 or $40 worth of service something. You know, it, it didn't say what that was. It didn't say equipment. It didn't say modem. It didn't, didn't tell me at all. It's just additional fee. I, you know, I, I think that that kind of information is a right to the consumer and they're not sharing that information. And then, like I said before, comparing apples to apples would be nice. Um, even within the one company, I was looking at their website and I could lower my cost if I got 200 M, but I don't know how 200 M compares to 15 Mbps. It's like, so what is 200 M? Will that run my television? You know, will I be able to do Zoom on 200 M? I, I have no idea what they're talking about. I'm not really a computer person. I'm, I'm kind of your wannabe nerd, self-taught computer person. So, you know, I, I recognize some of the numbers and if they use the same letters after them, I can make a comparison. But if they change the letters up, I have no clue. I, I completely hear you. Um... Alan Smith, I see, I see you nodding your, your head. Would love to get your thoughts on, you know, a specific kind of question for you, because you actually were able to subscribe, test, unsubscribe, and then resubscribe. So do you, did you find that the price the providers had advertised to you was in line with the price that you actually paid? Or did you find that fees, taxes, and other types of charges added a significant cost? And then maybe if I could add on to kind of your reaction to the uh, 2015 label, Right, um, and and how much of that information is useful in kind of today's uh, marketplace? Uh, yeah. So can I can I do the second part first? Because I think that I'm when I was, when I was looking at that label, um, I from from my current vantage point now, I was really pleased and excited by the idea of like 
the performance section where there's a typical speed downstream, a typical speed upstream, typical latency, like that already says to me that I'm, I'm getting more information than whatever the advertiser was telling me I was going to get. But then I also try to think about where I was two years ago at the start of the pandemic, and I was maybe a little closer to Adero than I am than I was to Chet. I maybe I've caught up a little bit now, and I now know what those numbers mean more from 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 uh, learned experience. But I think I started out not being sure what those numbers were going to mean. So I think uh, if there was space on the label for context. Um, would be really wonderful. Like, uh, I, I think that there would be many ways that context could happen, but kind of what these numbers mean and, and what they can teach us. I, I don't think we, I, I, I'm not too worried about um, too much information as someone who was kind of a concerned shopper, but I would have benefited a lot from context. Um, to go to your second, first half of your question about whether or not I had any sense I was honestly, I was just adding 50% in my brain to whatever I was seeing quoted. So if I saw a plan that was $99 a month, I would just add 50% in my <laughs> calculus for what it was eventually going to cost me when it included taxes and fees and setups and all that sort of stuff. And so I just, um, I, I learned very quickly that, that I was never going to get the quoted number and I just had a little mnemonic for myself to jump to what it would actually be when I when I finally paid the bill, and that ended up being fairly accurate. Uh, as your, a as your a, plus fifty percent uh, formula would ended up being pretty accurate. Yeah, when you carry it out over the fact that I was paying different installation fees and dis and and um, I probably way more than your average consumer, right. I was paying those. Uh, connection and disconnection fees in, in shorter order than anyone should uh, because I was comparison shopping. Um, yes, it ended up being about accurate to call it about 50, 50% more. Got it. Well, thank you for that. So we are, uh, run, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to kind of give you all an opportunity to kind of share any last thoughts, you know, on how the commission can help best consumers make informed decisions. You know, um, based on your experience, based on your reaction to the to the old labels, and maybe I think kind of pie in the sky, what information would be helpful for you in the future, or you think for maybe new consumers who have never shopped for broadband before? Um, and Alan Pat, uh, Patton, I'm happy to start with you. Um, like Chet, in fact, I had I went right down 100 down the line with what he said. And we hadn't even talked before this about what he, his thoughts were. It's interesting that um, I do think that the availability business is very critical. And I think something along of a, a percent availability uptime, which means basically you have the internet or you don't. And the other piece would be is, is uh, you kind of have it uh, covered with the usual uh, speeds to expect. So that may cover it, but I would also think in terms of the percent available at the speed that you're purchasing. So if I see that I'm, get it, I'm going to get it 80% of the time, well, that tells me something versus somebody who's doing 60% of the time. So who do you think I would go with? I'd be looking at the 80%. Uh, the other thing I also uh, thought uh, was that the uh, network management part of it, when I looked at that, I said, I think I know what you're talking about. You talk about tools that I as an end user can have to check the check out the network versus the, the versus the uh, providers doing that, and they can check your remote modem and that kind of stuff. Because I had that happen with me, but I thought you know what, ninety percent of customers are not going to know what that is. Hmm. So I think the wording might be wrong. There might be a better way to to, to simplify that so that's clear what those two things are in the network area. Got it. Boy, it threw me, and I'm in tech too, and that threw me, and I had to stop and think what that was. I hear that. Thank you, Alan. Um, Adero, any any closing thoughts? Yeah, the main thing for me is uh, clarity of terminology. So if we're comparing apples to apples, that's helpful. And if we have a true definition of high speed that isn't 25 here, 15 there, and and 150 there. It would be good to know, you know, high speed is this and anything above, you know, just some clarity. Got it. 
Chad, what about you? Just kind of adding to the thoughts of, uh, you know, how do you measure something? Uh, I was almost thinking, could there be an independent agency that they submit, uh, you know, these, these things to that evaluate and provide a score, you know, a grade that c consumers can look at and say, you know, this is grade A versus B versus C. And then below that are all the facts, right? Because it's, it's very hard to digest all of this stuff for a normal person, right? But, as, you know, if you had a single number that said, you know, grade A, this means these things, uh, and it comes at this cost, then you can compare between two providers fairly easily. That's just something that I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. What about you, Jackie? Um, any, any information that you think uh, would be helpful for you in the future? Okay, well, yes. <laughs> I would really like to see something there that said, you can run, you need this much speed to run this many uh, pieces of equipment on your Wi-Fi. Um, I'd also like to really point out that the part of the label where it showed what your data was and then what you would pay if you went over that, I think that's really important because my provider originally said, oh, you have unlimited. And then I got a bill one month, it was like, higher than my normal bill. And I called up and I'm like, what is this for? And I said, oh, well, you went over our, our one terabyte um, data. So you have to pay for the extra. And I'm like, but that's not what you told me. So okay. I like the fact that the label has a clearly states that, okay, your package comes with this much. If you go over it, this is what you need. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's very important, whether it's in your telephone, your telephone data, or you're coming into your house on your Wi-Fi data. And then just tell me, can I run like two TVs and, and you know, whatever, or do I, you know, what, what speed do I have to have to run X number of pieces of equipment, so. Right, we got to get Jackie her, her connected home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it also helps if you uh, have it in terms of equipment that the average person uses rather than, this is great for gaming because I have no idea what kind of usage that is. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you, if you do, I looked up the qual what kind of a computer you were recommended to data science, which I do on a volunteer basis. And it's the same as a gaming computer, except for the um, graphics card. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, yeah, if you if you do heavy data work, you need a gaming computer. <laughs> but, but most people just want to like go online and do social media and, and mm -hmm. watch TV. So right. Like I said, you guys are way ahead of the game, so I very much kind of value your perspective. I'm happy to end uh, with, with, with Alan Smith from New York. Any kind of last thoughts on, on what, you, what information might be helpful for you, both today and in the future, or maybe to new consumers that are out there shopping for broadband, do you think the commission should consider as we as continue to think through this, this uh, broadband labels proceeding? I like to echo the, um, you know, drop out percentage or the grade, uh, you know, this is not connected for this percentage of the time um, or in your zip code or in your area, here's, here's how often this went down. Um, I think some sort of consistency score along that line would be really, have been really useful for me. Um, and I'm also really kind of interested and intrigued when I think about my own shopping process. And this is not so much what's in the label, but where the label appears. Um, and sort of when it gets in front of consumers, because a lot of the time I would sort of look on the internet, shop around, then I would call up somebody, I'd get some different numbers from the person on the phone that didn't seem to have any connection to what I've seen online. And I'm kind of wondering sort of where is there a consistent moment for delivering this information that is cross platform and cross reality. But thank you guys for very much for having us. Of course. So thank you all again for your thoughts today. I think it's really refreshing to hear from consumers from across, across the country to learn more about your experience in different parts um, of the United States. Um, so thank you again. That concludes our uh, consumer roundtable portion of the hearing. And next, I think that we have a short video testimonial from another new friend, uh, Don, in um, New Mexico. Hello, my name is Donald Cole. 
I live in New Mexico in the foothills of the Manzano Mountains, a rural area with widely spaced residents. And so the access to me is through satellite or cell tower type service for the internet. Um, what would make a difference to me in trying to select a provider would be whether or not they could provide me with a average speed that I could expect for upload and download in my area versus time of day. Uh, I find that most claims of speeds refer to their maximum speeds and give you very little idea of actual capability during different times of the day. So that information could make a big difference in my selection of an internet provider. Good afternoon. I'm Christy Thornton. I'm Acting Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau at the, in the Consumer and Government, <laughs> let me start that again. Good afternoon. I'm Christy Thornton, Acting Chief of the Consumer Policy Division in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau at the FCC. It's a pleasure to be part of this hearing today and to introduce the two panelists joining me to discuss how consumers make choices and how the way we make choices can and should impact the design of the broadband information label. Joining me today is Dr. Ellen Peters and Dr. Lori Craner. Dr. Ellen Peters is the Philip H. Knight Chair and Director of the Center for Science Communication Research at the University of Oregon. She's an expert in the psychology of how people judge and decide, and also in how to present information, especially numbers, so that people can understand and use them to make effective choices. Dr. Lori Craner is the Director and Bosch Distinguished Professor in Security and Privacy Technologies at Scilab and the Four Systems Professor of Computer Science and of Engineering at the Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University, where she also directs the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory. In 2016, she served as Chief Technologist at the United States Federal Trade Commission. Dr. Craner's research focuses on usable privacy and security and has included among other things, the design and evaluation of privacy nutrition labels and privacy choice interfaces. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna get started by asking a question um, that I would love both of you to offer feedback on. Um, there are a lot of labels in our everyday lives. Some are better than others. What are some of the characteristics of a label that are helpful to consumers? Perhaps content, design, quantity of information, or the language that is used on them. Are there examples of labels that embody these characteristics? And I'd love for either of you to start. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start with um, just some, some characteristics that make up good labels because they these same kind of characteristics are important for any kind of numbers that you might, numbers, for example, and other information that you might present. Um, but you mentioned less information, for example. Less information is better. Um, and that's especially true, <clears throat> excuse me, that's especially true for somebody who is less, who has less ability, they have less time, they're just less motivated. Um, uh, I, I, I wanted to stop for a second and mention that your consumers were kind of amazing. They uh -huh. provided some really, really important and thoughtful comments. Um, one of the ones that um, Ms. Allison, Ms. Allison talked about was that idea of, and this is important for labels, um, to be able to compare apples to oranges. Yeah. So for example, to ha always have things in the, in the same units. You know, don't compare ki kilobytes to gigabytes, for example. Consumers don't know how to do that. You have to do the math for them. Um, you also have to do the math for them when it comes to costs, if you really want them to understand what's going on. Um, you also, and this is a this is um, very similar to the comment about con context from Mr. Smith. You have to help them evaluate the options, um, either by having options side by side for easier comparison, so they can evaluate on their own. Um, help, um, help them figure out what kind of a broadband user they are. Are they a gamer or, or, or not? Are they, um, you know, how, how often are they using um, which different kinds of, 
of broadband capacities and, and what does that mean for what they need there for. Um, and providing benchmarks, somebody, it might've been Mr. Mehta mentioned that idea of providing benchmarks. What's, okay, given who I am, what's the minimum amount that I need? These are the kind of, um, these are the kind of things that reduce the cognitive effort for the consumer. It helps them evaluate the options um, and it makes them, it helps them be a better consumer. It helps them um, understand the information, um, integrate it with their own values and make a better choice that, that, meets, that, that helps them meet their own needs. Yeah, um, I, I do wanna give you obviously Dr. Craner a chance to answer. We've talked about, thank you Dr. Peters for referencing the, the consumers who were just here. I also found that fascinating. One of the things that you've mentioned is like there's different information that we would that all of us find useful. That's a lot of information. Dr. Craner, can you help us process like on, going back to what makes a good label? What makes a good label in terms of the amount of information on it? Yeah, we don't want to overwhelm people with too much information. Um, we also uh, one of the things that's nice about a label is that it's in a standardized format. And so if there's certain information I'm looking for, if it's always in the same place, I may be able to ignore some of the other information. So with you know, food nutrition labels, if what is important to me is say cholesterol and I don't care about sodium, I can ignore sodium and just focus on cholesterol. Um, so to some extent, um, you know, there's the ability to do that, but at some point it just becomes too overwhelming if there's a lot of information. Um, I think one of the uh, possibilities that we have today, now that labels don't have to be just on printed paper, is that we could have information that's interactive. And so we have the ability to have digital labels where consumers could say, hey, I'm a gamer, this is what I want, and just see the um, information that is going to be most relevant to them. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Because I think some of our consumers mentioned that, like, I'm not a gamer, this isn't important to me, but obviously there are people who are gamers. There are also students, there's elementary school students or high school students, there's people who work from home, there are libraries. And we all have different needs that we bring to this. I think Alejandro, when he was talking to consumers said, like, what's most important to you versus what's not important to you. When we're dealing with American consumers as a whole, how do, how do we design a label or can we design a label that meets the needs of, of all of these different people? Is it possible to do that? And if not, how do we prioritize or help people prioritize? Yeah, so I think one thing that we can do is we can specify um, a list of pieces of information that the um, broadband providers have to provide on their labels and in a standard format for doing that and in a format that is computer readable, that, it, that it's metadata. Um, and all of that information could go into a database. Um, and then when we actually show a label to a consumer, um, we might have the standard printed label but we also have this database of information and you could imagine a website or an app on a phone or something where it can ask the consumer, you know, what are the three things most important to you? And the consumer indicates what they are and then they see a comparison against those most important things. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Peters, did you have a follow-up for that? If not, I have a question for you. I actually did have a quick follow-up. Um, a lot of what I I study a lot of um, a lot of tasks where people who are are either lower or higher in math ability, what we call numeracy. <clears throat> Excuse me, and about twenty nine, about a third of U.S. adults. It's actually twenty nine percent, but about a third of U.S. adults can't do what might be a similar task at least the first time that they that they see one of these broadband labels. They're they're not able to use a table to select um, the health plan with the lowest cost based on an annual premium and annual deductible for a family. So, so you can imagine that might be sort of a similar task as the broadband label where you're trying to select a service with a particular, uh, you know, the lowest cost given what you need for data usage and speed, data, um, data usage and speed. I don't know for sure. I've never tested what happens when you do it over and over again, as, as Dr. Craner is suggesting. And it may be that they can learn that but they can't do it the first time. So I, I'm not quite as sure that even having data in the same location each time, given how seldom most people go about um, choosing a broadband service, I'm not convinced that you might not lose a third of your a, a third of US adults right from the get-go. So, so I just wanted to bring that up as a little bit of a counterpoint to what Dr. Craner said. 
Yeah, I actually uh, agree with that, that, um, uh, yeah, some of this information is, is just going to be confusing. And, you know, nutrition label, we, we buy food products all the time. We hopefully are not buying broadband all the time. Hopefully, once we find a provider, we can stick with them for a while. Um, and so that uh, that is an issue as well. Um, I think also, you know, thinking about the pricing and figuring out, well, how much is it really going to cost me? Um, again, this is another area, though, that a digital label could help us um, because because of the fact that often it's like there's an introductory rate and then it changes. Um, you you could in fact um, ask to say, if I if I keep this for one year. How much will it cost me after one year and have the math be done behind the scenes and you just get the three numbers for these three providers of how much you will have spent after one year or six months or whatever length of time you want. I love this uh, Dr. Craner's idea of a digital label. I think the idea of, of being, able to, being able to have something behind the scenes massage this data for people and then present it side by side is, is really ingenious. I, I love that. I want to back up just a second. So let's before we talk about the nuances of a label, of a digital label, and thank you for thinking creatively. I love it. Um, let's back up to how people make choices. We're designing a, um, we've proposed a print label that would also be displayed at point of sale. And that's one of the issues we're looking at is what does point of sale mean? But we're doing that separately. We're designing a label that consumers would use to make decisions. Dr. Dr. Peters, could you tell me how people make decisions? How do they use information? How do they gather information to make decisions? Can we just start, let's back up a little and start there. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, people have to get the information and, and how they gather it depends a lot. Um, people differ quite a bit in how much, they're, how much they wanna go and seek out information, um, how much time they're willing to spend on it. So you, so you get lots and lots of individual differences in terms of that seeking out of information, but they have to get the information at, at some point if they're gonna use it. It has to be available and accurate and, and, and it has to be available to them in a timely fashion for them to make the decision. Um, the you know, Transparency is key. Um, and th that is the great idea behind this broadband label, that, that that's what you're doing. You're making that information available. And so when it comes to seeking out information, hopefully it's just gonna be there in front of their face at the point they're making a decision about broadbands. It'll be easy to find um, and, and hopefully easy to understand. But they do have to be able to understand the information. And that's kind of the next way that the, the decision process works. That, that understanding is just a basic building block that we often assume is true if we give out information, but it's not always true. Um, how you present information makes a really big difference to how well people understand it, and especially people who are lower in ability, um, or even time and motivation too. Um, it also though, and this goes back to some of the consumer comments from before, uh, good decision-making requires more than just simple understanding of information because consumers also have to understand the meaning of that broadband, that, that provided broadband information for their decision. They, they have to, um, you know, if there's a monthly fee of $60 and 300 gilo, um, uh, gigabytes, what does that mean for them? Is that, a, you know, is, is that, how much is that gonna cost me across the course of the year? Um, to, to Dr. Craner's point, is the 300 gigabytes enough data for me? Um, so they have to be able to understand the meaning of those facts. Um, and then they have to be able to determine meaningful differences between options. That goes back to information presentation again, um, being able to compare apples to oranges, being able to compare options side by side. Um, they have to be able to weight factors to match their needs and values. Um, and oftentimes we're not quite sure what we need and we don't know how much we value 300 gigabytes versus 500 gigabytes. Th these are actually kind of hard things to do. So it's not like you can just give out information and people simply make a choice. They also have to make trade-offs. Um, and ultimately they do have to choose. They, they, do, they do have to choose. But if you go through all those processes and you make a meaningful choice based on understanding information and its meaning and being able to make trade-offs, it's actually kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. And that's where information presentation can come in because how you present information can somehow matter as much as what, in what information is presented. Yeah, Dr. Craner, did you want to respond to that? 
Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, one of the things that kept coming up with the consumers is that, you know, they don't know how much they need. They just know that they don't want their um, internet to get dropped in the middle of their Zoom call, right? You know? um, and, and so the idea of having, um, first of all, benchmarks to know, like, what is a good number to have in order to do Zoom or to do games or to do whatever. Um, but also, I think the proposed label doesn't really um, say much about reliability and how often there are outages and things like that, which I think is, is a big factor that, you know, my, my home um, broadband is great when it works, but when there's an outage, it's terrible. And I want to know how often I'm going to have an outage. Um, so, so I think the, those are, are useful. I was also going to mention that that putting examples in context is helpful. Um, I was thinking about the, the light bulb labels, lighting facts. Um, which, which are in a pretty nice, simple label when you go to buy light bulbs. Um, but what's really useful is that at a lot of hardware stores and one of the places I shop for light bulbs, they have a display where you can turn on the lights and see what color they look like in, in different different types of rooms. And you know, just seeing that it's a 3000K light bulb, that doesn't tell me much, but seeing that, oh, this is what a really warm light bulb looks like, that's much more helpful. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And I appreciate that you, you're talking about taking information, but then putting it in context. And one of the things Dr. Peters was just saying is how you present the information helps convey the meaning for it. And so I would love, Dr. Craner, with your experience designing or giving input on labels and thinking about labels, are there, and you just gave me one example, but are there other good examples of the context in which information is presented, how it influences the way we 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 give meaning to it and and receive meaning from it yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of labels out of context, you know, they look nice, but they they actually aren't all that useful out of context. And um, uh, I, I think it, it is more, you know, the, the question of, you know, can I actually apply it in, in a particular situation? And in thinking about how we evaluate the quality of a label, we really need to evaluate whether people can use it to make decisions. Um, and, you um, uh, when when I was at the Federal Trade Commission, we we actually had a, a workshop on, uh, on on consumer notices and how to evaluate them, um, and uh, we we had people coming from very different areas. But what they were all saying is, you know, this context is so important. So there were people who, for example, work on um, over-the-counter um, medications and the labels on there. Um, and if you get that wrong, that could actually be really dangerous. Someone could take the wrong dosage and, mm -hmm. you know, hurt themselves, die maybe, right? Um, and, uh, and so they talked about how, you know, in their testing, they actually give people scenarios with different sorts of medical symptoms and show them the product packaging and say, so how much of this should you take, right? And it's really critical that the consumer can understand that properly. Um, so I think those are some of the things that we need to look at is, is how would people use it in an actual decision context? I wonder if I could offer another example that that sort of um, kind of a, uh, not that medicine isn't an everyday context, but another everyday context. Well, one of the things I often think about um, uh, has to do with nutrition facts. And so if you're, if you're uh, you know, hopefully at some point we're all going to be back at, at meetings and they're going to offer snacks at the meetings and we're going to go out at break and we're going to be choosing whether we have a cookie or a piece of fruit. Um, and, uh, you know, the cookie, you could put a, a calorie label on that cookie, like 300 calories or whatever, um, but that often isn't very meaningful to people. But if you mm -hmm. translate that into something that's more experiential, um, something that people can relate to more on an everyday basis. And you say, well, it would take about 40 minutes to walk off the calories from that cookie. That suddenly becomes something that kind of comes alive for people. It's part of their life. They, they know what that experience of walking briskly for 40 minutes might be. Um, and I think there's actually an example that came up with one of the consumers that kind of fits that. Um, I really like that idea. And I don't remember who said it, but about a consistency score. We mm -hmm. all know what it is to lack consistency in internet. And it's terrible for all of us, whether we're missing a movie, dropping a call, or we're suddenly on a Zoom panel and like your picture goes all haywire. Um, but those, those kind of experiential experientially oriented um, uh, kind of um, factors can be really important to help people make decisions. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I noticed that too. There's again, lots of really interesting information hearing from different people's perspectives. One of the different perspectives that different consumers have is different amount of time. We also have people with, um, with disabilities, different languages accessing these labels or wanting to, to access these labels. Um, if people with limited education also are gonna need to be able to access these labels, are there things that we could do to how the label is designed that would aid people with either limited time or limited language skills to be able to make the information more useful in decision-making? I mean, oh, do you want to go ahead? No, yeah, go ahead. Love you. I, a lot of what we've been talking about would help people with lower ability. And I'm trying to think through um, coming from a different language. But with, with lower ability, um, having less information, doing crunching those numbers for them rather than asking them to do it. Um, all of, you know, having those side-by-side -side comparisons, having benchmarks, all of those things are things that people with lower ability um, are they're just gonna be able to grab more meaning from the data and they're gonna be able to match it to their needs better. Um, so all of those help. When it comes to someone with a different language, then you have to look extremely carefully at the words, of course, maybe using fewer words, using more visuals as opposed to words, um, do, doing those kind of things. I suspect that Dr. Craner may have some experience with this in labels though, and she may have some more to say um, about either topic, but especially about the different language. Yeah, I, I think um, you know different languages um, are are difficult, and uh, people often say, "Well, we'll just go with all pictures." And what we've seen is that pictures, you know, symbols don't really work very well mm -hmm. when we're talking about kind of amorphous concepts. Um, and you know, some of the some of the concepts here. Uh, even when we spell out the words, people are having trouble with what they mean, you know, let alone if we just show them a picture and don't spell out the words. I, I, I think it's, it's going to be uh, difficult to convey meaning with, with some of these things with just pictures. Um, so I think we need to be prepared to have uh, translations into multiple languages. Um, and, uh, you know, when it's on, on paper, you know, it, it, it may be that depending on the neighborhood you're advertising in, you know, the demographics tell you what languages should be available. Um, when it's digital, then we can, you know, automatically translate into the language that the user's web browser is in. Mm. Um, if you, could, could I could I just yeah. add quickly just one one quick point? It actually comes from one of the panelists. Um, I had the same reaction as one of the panelists to the broadband label down around uh, network management. Mm -hmm. I read English. The the panelists, the consumer read English. Had even I think he was from an IT background. Had yeah. no idea what the words meant. And yeah. so even if you're an English speaker, um, yeah. sometimes the words get in the way. <laughs> yeah, which is an interesting an interesting kind of problem to face of. We're limited in symbols. Numbers are complicated for people to comprehend. We've got a, everyone wants something different or has a different priority. Words are complicated and technical words particularly are complicated. We're limited in space um, on the amount that can be displayed, but we also have an opportunity. We're not just limited to paper. We, we can use the internet, but also not everyone has the internet, right? People are shopping for broadband services. And so if we're, we're in a kind of a, all of these things filtered together, we're trying to meet the needs of consumers, but also broadband service providers have, have a voice here and we need to respect that voice. Um, uh, given all of those competing interests and needs, and this is a very, it's a difficult question to get even phrase, not, not much less answer, like, what do you think the priorities, one or two priorities should be? Should we focus more on language? Should we focus more on visual? Should we focus on narrowing down what's on the label? What should the priority be? Well, I think we should um, focus on a smaller number of attributes that are the things that consumers are actually using in their decision making as what's primarily on the label. I think we should keep all the other information as, you know, by, by available by clicking through and, you know, you can, it's available somewhere, but for what, what is on that top level label, um, you know, and we've heard from consumers, they, they care a lot about price and what it actually costs, not the introductory fee and all the other stuff. Um, they care a lot about reliability, which isn't even on the label right now. 
And then they care a lot about whether it's fast enough for the types of applications they want. Um, and so the, is it fast enough? Is it reliable? And how much does it cost? Um, well, I, would, I would love to actually do more research beyond just you know, the, the, the handful of people who are here and find out you know, from a wider range of consumers, what is it that they really want and focus on making that front and center. I 100% agree. I would add to that, and I think Dr. Craner would too, find out what are the types of users out there and provide the benchmarks for them. Tell me more about that. Benchmarks isn't a phrase I normally use, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, thank you for asking me to clarify. Um, uh, somebody who is a gamer needs a different, um, a different, a different speed than somebody who is uh, just streaming videos um, every now and again. Uh, and so providing, you know, this, a lot of the consumers talked about, and I'll bet every consumer that you talk to eventually after this will talk about, you know, I, I'm not sure what I need. Like, I don't, I don't know what those numbers are. I know what I kind of do every day. And if you ask me a week ahead of time, I'll try to pay attention for a week. So I really have a better idea of what it is that I do. And, and then, you know, if, if they could, you know, and, and then you need to tell me what the benchmark is. Like, how much do I need? I want to pay less, but I also want to have enough. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I'd, I'd like for you for just a minute to put yourself in my position. Um, if, the, if you were at the FCC, we're given the task of create a dream label. <laughs> and that isn't actually the job that I've been given. But <laughs> if you were given that role and you could choose format or color or symbol or visual of some sort, what would you choose? What would you put on it to, to best convey information? I would focus on what words and information was on it. I would not spend your time too too much on color or symbols or, or things like that and fonts like yeah um, <laughs> I, yeah the, the, the fonts and the and whatever you have right now are, are okay yeah. um, <laughs> but I, I, I think really it's it's what is the most important information? what are the words that are going to best convey that information? And to people who vary in ability. Yeah, yeah, and and I think you know if we can get beyond the um, you know putting on words like like uh, you know latency and um, uh, typical speed downstream and stuff, which I I mean I'm a computer scientist. I don't even know what the good values are for those things. That those don't even help me, right? Um, and instead, we could we could focus more on these benchmarks that. Um, uh, you know, there, there is enough of whatever so that I can play games so that I can do Zoom and it's not going to be annoying. Like that, that's really what, what we need. Is there anything, um, I, I'm trying to phrase, to figure out how to phrase this question, but is there something that, um, Language is tricky. You've both mentioned that. Language is tricky and we need to be careful on it. And yet consumers have mentioned introductory rates. Congress has specifically asked us to address introductory rates. It's a difficult concept to, to kind of balance. It, can you speak to how a consumer thinks about those in it, introductory rates in the decision-making, how discounts, like discounts generally in shopping, play into decision-making and how we could kind of address that on a label? Hmm. So, yeah, well, every, I, every, oh, go ahead. Okay. I, I would say, I, I think, you know, part of the reason why they have these sorts of discounts and introductory rates is because they are useful for kind of manipulating consumers and making them think they're getting a better deal than they actually are. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, I think it's difficult for consumers to actually rationally make comparisons when, when they're dealing uh, with these changing rates. Um, so I, I think having some um, sort of a, a, a standard period, and I don't know if one year is the right amount, but, but something like a year where, you're, where you say, all right, at the, at the end of the year, this is how much you will have paid if you were on this deal, would make it easier for consumers to do that comparison. Yeah, I, I agree. Everybody loves a sale, but you can get sucked in by it. <laughs> and the idea of, of um, requiring, you know, having some rules around maybe how long a sale is going to last. And the only reason I'm saying that is that 
doing this wrapping up of prices, adding together the prices for people. You don't want the broadband companies to be playing tricks with their timing in order to get around your, your rules. Yeah. And so if, so if you have a rule about, well, a sales can only last this amount of time, and then you wrap up prices and say, well, here's what it's gonna cost for year one. And I would even wonder, here's what it costs for year two. Um, because it could be that the sale lasts for a year and then year two, it like doubles or triples, but it's part of your contract. Thank you. Um, is Again, we're trying to balance consumer needs. You're talking about a lot of numbers, right? You're talking about, okay, an introductory rate, a normal rate, a one year, a two year, a total, a, their, their, um, their, their fees and their taxes. And is, would there be numbers that are more of a priority than others um, that you can imagine would be more of a priority than others? So to me, this is actually an empirical question. This is something that you ask consumers about and you find out what is most important to them. I would guess based on work I've done in, um, on, on things like Medicare and Medicaid that the upfront cost is very important. There's some upfront costs, so, you know, maybe I can't even afford that upfront cost so I shouldn't be considering it at all. And so, you know, that, that's one thing, but um, the monthly charge makes a huge difference to a lot of people because does it fit within my budget? Can I actually pay that or not? Um, the yearly cost is something that is more of a signal, I think, to um, is more of a signal of, oh my gosh, that's gonna end up being much, that there's gonna be a change in cost from this period to this period, and it's gonna be much more expensive than I, than I anticipated. Yeah, and, and I think um, this is the sort of thing that would be nice to like do a little study, <laughs> come yep. up with a few different approaches and put them in front of consumers and find out what works. You know, and, this and can again, be I would, empirically tested. And again, I would, I, would, I, would, I would suggest that you test based on people who vary quite a bit in ability because you don't wanna, what, what, um, the people who are more vulnerable, who have less ability are gonna be the ones who are already left behind. You mm -hmm. don't wanna further disadvantage them, in my opinion. Yeah, and so you. and so presenting information so that the people who are um, who are most likely to be tricked by a sale, who are most likely to just not understand the information, those are the people you want to be. You, you really want to understand how how much they understand and don't understand. Thank you. One more question, and then I think we're out of time. Um, we've talked about a simple conveyance of information on a label, and then more information in other places. That to me says a lot of click throughs. Do consumers tend to get lost in that type of information or has our society in general become so familiar with that, that that's something the majority of consumers can handle? Oh, I think we should assume that most consumers will never click through. Um, and the reason to have the click through information is for experts, not for consumers. Or for the really, really motivated consumer. We heard from some of them today. That's both good points. Thank you. Um, any final thoughts, things we should consider, points that we haven't mentioned today? Test with your consumers. Yeah, yeah, user studies, testing, really important. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your expertise, for your input, for your time today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, and next we have a short testimonial from Lee in Florida. Thank you. We have a lot of people in this area who are state workers. They must be online, uh, no matter whether that uh, pandemic occurred or not. They, they, ha they had to depend on the internet. And there was education too, there's a lot of kids. And so kids uh, were not able to uh, connect with their classes. And uh, so there, there's a lot of issues in this particular area, I'd say Tallahassee in general is, is a kind of a uh, internet desert where you really don't see um, choices, many choices. I would Google uh, the different choices, uh, different services, but see, you, you go, when you start rooting down to uh, the various choices like Xfinity um, and some of the uh, satellite services, you actually have to go to the individual site and see what they have available. And of course, there, 
sometimes I think they they are kind of sugarcoating some of the things that are that they have to offer. And of course, they they talk about a a, a money figure like CenturyLink said uh, forty nine dollars per month forever, and I had a package deal, and it, and the package deal kept going up and up and up and up. Uh, that that that's no good. So. Uh, you know, if you if they're going to advertise something or have it on their website, it needs to correspond with reality uh, because fees are a big thing where they change all the time. Hello. I'm Ed Bartholomew, the Associate Bureau Chief in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau here at the FCC. I have the pleasure of being joined today by three panelists to discuss what types of information households need when evaluating broadband service plans. Joining me are Amina Fazula. She's the Senior Director of Equity Policy and Common Sense's DC office, where she works on a range of issues, including privacy, platform accountability, expanding access to technology, and digital well being. I'm joined by Angela Seifer. She founded NDIA, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, in 2015 and has been working in the field we now call digital inclusion since 1997. She has helped physically set up consumer computer labs in underserved areas, managed broadband conferences, conducted research, managed digital inclusion programs, and assisted with the Department of Commerce's Broadband Adoption Toolkit. She's also testified before Congress. I'm also joined today by Jonathan Schwantz. He's a senior policy counsel in Consumer Reports DC office, where he focuses on telecommunications and competition issues affecting consumers in broadband, television, media, and wireless markets. And beyond their current roles, all three of my guests have a history of working in the fields of digital inclusion and equity. Thank you all for joining me today. Amina. I wanted to start with you. Common Sense focuses on helping kids thrive in a world of technology. And thinking about the information that families need when they're evaluating broadband service options, what's changed over the last two years, especially as in, you know, in light of the pandemic? Yes, I'm so much has changed for families when it comes to technology. And I don't know that the pandemic's going to be the moment where, you know, we've seen the last acceleration of that, you know. As, uh, as technology improves, as there are more innovations in different areas, I think families will continue to adopt technology and will be required to adopt technology in order to thrive. So what we've seen is families are needing to have robust internet connections, robust access to devices, and robust knowledge of how to use technology to be able to access education. Um, access education, not just for say, um, distance learning, but also to make up for issues around learning loss uh, during the um, height of the pandemic. Um, so continuing to support students, even though they go back to school, um, to make sure that they have additional tutoring support and additional um, wraparound services. Um, a lot of that is happening online. Also, families are using telemedicine. Um, so making sure that they have access to robust service that enables their ability to participate with healthcare resources. Um, sometimes this is telemedicine, actual appointments, things like that. That can be um, hugely helpful to a family that's under-resourced with respect to time and money to make sure that they can do a little bit more preventative care, um, that they can just pop in and ask a few questions or actually start to get to know their caregivers a little bit better. Um, and also, um, there's healthcare with respect to public health. So being able to access information about um, uh, vaccines, about rising case counts, um, about um, what the appropriate preventative measures are, um, all of that is also often delivered online. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are plenty of other reasons why families are getting online, but also there's remote work and um, upskilling and job retraining. So as um, parents and caregivers in the household are um, experiencing job loss and looking to retrain 
or are required to work from home or are trying to take advantage of remote work opportunities because of disruptions in childcare. All of that um, also relies on access to the internet. Thanks for that. And, and I think it really kind of points to what we heard during the last panel is that there's a need here to contextualize, right? So you, you just listed off sort of a lot of things that require different capacities and potentially different use cases. Um, so as you're thinking about that sort of growth of, of need and, and the different ways households might approach internet access, how does a label or, or other, how, do a la how does a label or any other tools really fit into helping households make informed decisions here? This is where a label is so critical. Um, you know, what we heard on some of the early, early consumer panels and, and from the experts on, on labels, um, you know, being able to understand, I'm trying to do this thing, right? I'm trying to access a second grade math tutor online through Zoom. Uh, what kind of internet service do I actually need to do that? Um, there isn't a part on the label that explains that. And so making sure that um, we have a pathway to make sure that this, this label that we've got in front of us can at some point provide consumers with that in-depth information so that they can actually compare and understand, okay, if it says 200 Mbps down and 10 Mbps up, what does that mean for my ability to have a stable Zoom connection or a stable telemedicine visit? Um, will I be able to rely on it when I need to? Um, and I think answering those questions are going to be really important. So that's, you know, that's the goal of the label. And it may not be, I know I stress this, because there's so many different needs, it may not be that the label has to say, this is going to be good for your Zoom tutoring session. But it should be, um, you know, able to support, you know, other consumer advocates who can help um, someone navigate those numbers and help somebody understand, you know, what you can do with 200 down, 10 up. Um, so, you know, being machine readable for one would be really helpful because then you have not just the label as a resource, but then potentially you have a whole universe of advocates that can also participate in supporting a consumer's decision-making process. Yeah, and, and Jonathan, I, I wanna invite you to jump in here. I know Consumer Reports, you know, puts a lot of information out there for consumers. I know that this is a place where you guys are already currently active. Um, how do you see the label fitting in with other existing tools um, that you and others might have and, and sort of creating that, that benchmark, right, for consumers to look to so that there's meaning and context around the information? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, and thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, we have a tool at Consumer Reports that really tries to answer the question, how much speed do you need? And it's really interactive, and I'm not saying we have the best tool. I know the FCC has one as well, but you just kind of add up the devices in your home, and we always suggest to consumers, it's probably more than you think. Count all the phones that are on the Wi-Fi network, your desktop computer, your laptops, probably your TV is hooked up to the internet maybe even your fridge, maybe even the baby monitor, it adds up. And so this tool can then just tell you once you just interactively input all the devices, what kind of speed you're gonna need. Is it 100 megabits per second? Is it 200? Is it a gig? Um, that's one way of doing it because we really view the label, and I agree with everything Amina said, that if we're able to look at all the service plans and machine readable labels offered by ISVs, we can then run that analysis and tell you this plan by Xfinity is great for this, for example. Um, but we see the label as a real consumer education opportunity. The, I always like to say the pandemic has made all of us more broadband aware. And the data of people taking speed tests in March of 2020 bears that out. It's boom, it's just, you know straight line up. People are like, finally, for maybe the further, I know I certainly did, taking a speed test for the first time to find out like, is my broadband good enough or not for working or learning from home? Um, so now two years later, we're gonna, we have the broadband label. We say it is a great opportunity to further this journey of consumer education about broadband and you know, what are all these terms in much in the same way with the nutrition label from 30 years ago, you know, 
we may not, you know, things like saturated fats and added sugars and dietary fiber were not on the tips of consumers' tongues, but now they are. And I think we have the same opportunity here with broadband. And Angela, I, I want to kind of pivot over to you because uh, education, right? That's right in National Digital Inclusion Alliance's wheelhouse. Um, you know, is this an educational opportunity? Is, you know, do consumers have the information they need to approach and digest what could potentially be on a label? Or do we have work we need to do there to help make sure people can understand what's, what's included? Yes, uh, thanks for having me, Ed. Yes, there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, NDIA represents organizations who are working on the ground to help folks sign up for affordable connectivity program to help them sign up for a low cost offer or just whatever's in town, um, devices, digital literacy. And all of that is connected to like the digital literacy understanding is connected to an understanding of what is available, what broadband speeds are available, what the service itself is, how reliable it is, what's a data cap, when does it kick in? There's lots of questions that are related to being able to read that broadband label. Um, so yes, the education piece of this is important and our affiliates are doing that work right now, but it needs to be lots of folks doing that work, right? And as I think as this label becomes something that's a reality for all of us, it will be easier for the folks on the ground who um, are affiliates and others who are helping their community members sign up for a broadband service. But then there's going to be others who they don't do broadband. It's not what they do, but it makes they get it enough that they can get into to it and then they can help their neighbors figure it out. And I know that your, your team members and your partners work directly with a lot of consumers to help them find plans that will meet their needs. And in the last video, we saw Lee alluded to this issue of, um, you know, what information is hardest to find when you're working with households and trying to sign them up and, and get them connected? The hardest to find information is the, the ongoing cost of the broadband service. Um, you might be able to find an introductory cost. Sometimes you can find an ongoing cost for it, but that's definitely the hardest piece of that information um, to get. Uh, sometimes the um, with some of the mobile providers, it's hard to tell exactly when they're going to throttle you because they all the plans all look very similar when you look at them. So being able to have a clear understanding of how long do I have this good internet for and when is my good internet go away and I'm left with something else. And you touched on another theme that we've heard a number of times both today and in questions that have been sent in advance of the of today's hearing. And th that's this concept of introductory or promotional rates. And, and how does the label account for those? Um, Jonathan, I know um, Consumer Reports does a lot of comparison, uh, like articles and content for consumers. How do you guys normally factor in things like introductory pricing when you're putting out a, a comparison piece? for? That's a, that's a great question. And I agree with Angela that this is what bedevils consumers the most and the sticker shock I just went through it myself when your promotion's up. It's like, holy cow, I'm now paying this. Um, I think there could be some agreement even with the ISPs of like, let's let's clear it up. Because as one of the academics suggested earlier, we all have a sale. And that's how we treat it as consumer reports. We treat it as this is a limited duration sale. And the real rate or what the industry calls the month to month rate, that's what needs to be on the label. We also think the label should also trigger you are, but you are under a promotional rate and it will expire on whatever, December 31st, 2022. So, and I agree that there's a fine line between putting too much information in the label to where it becomes useless, it's information overload. But there also needs to be the resources to, to address consumers' number one concerns. And, you know, we like it when ISVs give discounts or promotional rates, but also I think many consumers are pretty savvy that yeah, this is a teaser rate. This is to get me in the door. This is to get me, if you're lucky enough to have competition, great, uh, you know, get me to switch. But it's, you know, all good things, you know, come to an end and as they do in promotional rates. And I think we have an opportunity and the biggest thing for Consumer Reports is to make it extremely clear that this is the full price, the month to month price, and your, your promotional rate will expire on such and such excuse me, such and such a date so consumers can plan and budget. Ed, can I offer that those promotional rates have also led to confusion um, about using the affordable connectivity program because we're, we're so accustomed to um, promotional rates that anything looks like that it's a deal 
this is a short term, this is not going to last because we've been conditioned that that's the way it works when we're purchasing our communication services. And thank you for that. That's, that's an interesting point for us to kind of think through and factor in here as we continue on the proceeding. I think um, it's also, oh, I was just going to note that it's also important to, to say that, um, you know, for families that might be considering signing up for internet service in advance of a school year, um, you know, they may find that the first year they can get away with something light, maybe coming out of the pandemic, they're realizing they want more going forward, if they're going to be doing more tutoring, or if they have a kid that's really into STEM, you know, there is a possibility that, you know, the household is going to want to change what type of service they have over time. And so it's even more important to understand the difference in those introductory rates, how long they last, is it a year, is it two years, um, what happens, you know, what is the cost for them to break, to go out early, all of that, having those numbers added up for them so they can really understand what they're getting into and for how long is really important. So empowering them with the full picture mm -hmm. that they're walking into. Um, we've a couple th another theme that's come up is uh, the, the idea of standardized terms, right? And how that can maybe potentially help people cut through the clutter. We've heard sort of apples to apples comparisons. Um, and one area where that's consistently, uh, you know, showing up is in relationship to advertised speeds. And we, we got a question from Larry in Nevada, and he's wondering if the commission should consider requiring advertised speeds, or I'm sorry, advertising, sorry, should require showing average speeds as part of the label, as opposed to the best effort speeds that typically show up in marketing materials. I think we're all like, yeah. <laughs> That's an excellent polite. idea. Right. Yeah, I was being polite. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like certainly in the context of a family, that average speed is going to mean everything, right? Um, they don't need to know what on a you know perfectly clear day what they're going to get. Um, you know, they want to know what they should expect they're going to get day in and day out. Um, this is even more critical when you've got, you know, a young child that's trying to engage with a tutor that goes out, you've lost learning for the day. I mean, even if it's just for a few minutes, restarting that kid back up again, if you're lucky enough to have a caregiver that can manage all that for them, that's going to be very difficult. Uh, a short, you know, telemedicine visit usually only lasts 30 minutes. You don't have a great connection for that 30 minutes, you're out of luck. And then it's very difficult to, you know, potentially reschedule. So that's, it's critical to understand the average. The advertised speeds issue in general is very challenging. So addressing it on the broadband label is a brilliant idea. So thank you, Larry, uh, because it would help lots of folks to be able to, it would, it would start to become more real to them, right? So when you hear of an ad, unless you're regularly running a speed test on your computer, some of us like to do that, but regular folks don't do that, right? Um, but if they if they know that that's what's on their label and things are not like things are slow for them, they can make without running a bunch of speed tests, they can be like, okay, I guess I need a I need more. So it's gonna it's gonna make more sense. Whereas with the advertised speeds, if you're if it's not working well for you one day and it is working well for you the next the next day, you're not sure if you need more or not because you don't have, like, there's not that consistent data. But if you can if you can think about it in terms of your average speed on the broadband label, that's gonna help you make it a more informed choice. Yeah, I will echo that. I know we like to make cheesy analogies in telecom, um, but the one I like to use for this is the speed limit between, you know, I'm in the DC area, between here and Richmond on Highway 95, Interstate 95 is 65 miles per hour. But that's good luck. Depends on the time of day when you're driving down to Richmond or, or you know which direction you're going in on 95 and when. The average speed is not 65. It could be 30. Um, so you know the ISPs will push back. Like there's a lot of different factors as to why consumers aren't getting the speeds that they think they're supposed to get. But um, but yeah, if you're going to advertise 500, but it really is 200 megabits per second, you know, it at least forces some tough conversations as to why is our physical plant not delivering those speeds or is our network too congested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think definitely it, 
we're, we like to operate in the real in the real world. Ed, so. Uh, I, I've heard machine readable come up at least two times already. Um, are there other formats or ways that we should be looking at uh, making the label information to, to available to consumers and consumer serving organizations? I think we heard some interesting ideas on the last panel and just wanted to get, welcome you all to that conversation as well. Languages. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Mina, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I was about to say the same thing. Um, having a, a digital label, label also allows you to have multiple languages, I think, with some um, fluidity. And that's, that's key. I think that's really important. Um, but also um, allows you to give the consumer deeper resources. So, you know, understanding that the resource on the label itself should be relatively short and to the point but you know to be able to comparison shop to be able to dig deeper if you do have that question when you you know start to talk to your kid and they want to be able to do x y and z um then you're going to look back at the label ideally and maybe you're going to want to know more information and that might not be information that you're going to put in like the top three boxes so you know being able to actually have a pathway to offer more info with the digital label i think is valuable With the question of machine readability, Ed, I mean, something that we're engaging with at Consumer Reports is we've asked consumers last year to share their, their ISP bills with us just to answer what you would think is a simple question. How much are American consumers paying for broadband every month? Uh, it's not an easy question to answer because all of these bills, they're not standardized. Um, what might be on a Spectrum bill is different than an AT&T bill, different than an Xfinity bill, different even from a Google Fiber bill. They're all it talk about different languages, they're all almost seemingly in different languages. And a lot of these bills do not even have the basic information you would think uh, would be on a bill. Like a lot of ISPs don't list the download and upload speeds. So in some, it's even hard to find out what the internet price is because as we've heard from consumers, um, I never thought I'd become an expert on fees, but there are so many fees. And if your internet's bundled with video or phone, good luck. Good luck even sometimes finding the internet price. But if you had a machine readable label and you had it on the monthly bill, our job at Consumer Reports, I could probably retire early. It would be much easier because we could just scan, you know, use OCR, scan the labels from all the different ISPs. And we could tell you, we could do it annually and tell you what consumers are paying um, for internet, what the fees are, what the taxes are, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't do that to beat up on the ISPs. We do it to help consumers and it's, that machine readability is kind of what Amina alluded to before. Yes, it's for consumers, but if academics and consumer groups can have it too, we can also put out resources to tell you, here is the average price of internet in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and here are the ISPs operating in that market. That, that's great information. Um, Angela, I want to come back to you and, and maybe dig in a little bit on, you know, what types of questions are you typically getting from the consumers that NDIA is working with and, and families that you're trying to get connected? Uh, questions are usually what's the cheapest plan, right, that meets my needs. Um, questions in terms of difference between mobile and wireline. So they don't use those words, right? It's more tell me the difference between a Spectrum account and my T-Mobile account. And that's much more common. Um, understanding how the affordable connectivity program works with with whatever the offers are um, the low cost offers that are only available to certain populations that versus the plans that are available to anyone um, and that's not the same as the affordable connectivity program right so it does get very confusing there's the plans that are available to everyone there are the plans that are only available to certain eligible populations. And then there's the affordable connectivity program, which will cover $30 or 75 on tribal lands towards any of those offers, only if the provider is a participating provider. Okay, is everybody confused now? <laughs> right? So if that's a lot for us in this moment to grasp, imagine um, maybe your reading level is low, right? Maybe um, three kids, life is stressful, and you're still in, you're trying to figure that you just worked a 12 hour day. And now you got to figure out your broadband service. Like it's a, it's a lot to figure out. Um, and so having, 
having somebody to help you is really essential. And that's the necessity of that broadband label because that broadband label is going to make it where some people, folks will be able to figure it out more likely than they could have on their own. And if they do have somebody helping them, that helper has a tool that they didn't have before. That's that's really interesting. Um, and thinking about that, yes, yeah, so we know there's questions, right? And we're getting a lot of questions um, and people are bringing questions to the table. But what are the risks for consumers if they misunderstand the details of broadband service or they're not clear on what they're getting? Are, are consumers out there overpaying or are they subscribing to services that don't meet their needs currently? We hear a lot of these stories at NDIA. So um, our affiliates are helping out, helping folks sign up or they're talking to them about devices or digital literacy and then they end up talking about their broadband service. Folks are way overpaying right? The bundled services are super confusing. Um, so not one piece of that is not understanding that you can get a lot of those same, that same programming that you get on your cable service, um, that you can then get it online or how to set that up and which services do you pay for to have the particular items that you need. All of that is, is super confusing. Um, it's, it's, it's a moment for all of us. This is our moment in time where this label is such an, op an opportunity for us to figure it out. Did Amina, Jonathan, do you wanna jump in on this one as well? Yeah, it, part of it is the pricing's tricky. I mean, we oftentimes hear from consumers like, well, I got the gigabyte plan, which is a thousand megabits per second, um, because it was actually cheaper than the 300 megabits per second plan. And it kind of goes back to the beginning of our conversation, Ed. Why? Because it's on a promotional rate. And and I mean, look, I I get it. But so it makes sense like, well, yeah, if it's only 70 bucks for the faster plan and you know, we've all been conditioned to like bigger, better, faster. I mean, that's what I should get, right? And it's like, well, yeah, as long as you put a reminder <laughs> that when your rate's going to probably double for that, that most expensive plan. But yeah, but it is... It is a bit of a, a shuffling you have to do, um, but in general, um, it, we haven't done any specific research on it, but we get the general sense that consumers typically are overpaying. And, and Angela makes a great point. I mean, we did research on the bundled plans and most of the fees that are hitting consumers like the broadcast TV fee, those attach to the video service. So the average of those, and this was three years old now, it's $37 a month. Um, so you might see a good bundled rate, but you pretty much got to add 40, 50 bucks to, for all the extra fees that attach. Um, so, but yeah, that's a different conversation about cord cutting, but, but yeah, I get the sense that the, the biggest confusion, and I heard it from the earliest, earliest panels are around fees and around pricing. Yeah, I would say, I just add that, like what we heard during the, um, the early days of the pandemic where there are families who are newly online because that was their only way to access education. Their biggest complaint was um, they were excited to get something. It turned out it wasn't good enough. And so they're basically back where they started. Um, so it is, you know, I think in addition to cost, it, there's also this sort of sense of like, I might need, especially if I'm new to using technology and new to the internet, I might need some time to figure out if this actually works for me. Um, and, you know, I think that it's scary when you look at the current market and you think I'm locked into a contract. I don't know what I can do if I need to change. Like there's no understanding of like what kind of flexibility you have or if you find a better deal later, can you actually take advantage of it? Um, or if you need more, service or less service, you know, how, how can you toggle that up and down? So, I mean, I think, again, having some clear understanding of the prices, the speeds, and how it relates to the uses, benchmarks, which I like as a, as a term, tech specs is one that was used in the past. I like benchmarks better, honestly. Um, but, you know, being able to tie those together and then being able to offer consumers access to, you know, more form fit um, support. So whether that's in person um, with a digital navigator 
or whether that is bouncing to a tool through, you know, advocacy organization like Consumer Reports or other organizations, I think that is going to be really useful to be able to help guide people through pricing and through actual um, understanding of what type of service they need to purchase. And I think you teed up an important point there, and it's the, the idea that, uh, you know, there, there's an audience for these labels that is beyond current users, right? So it's it's new people coming to the internet, right? So as we think about our goals around closing the digital divide, you know, how does a label fit into that, especially, at, you know, when you think about less connected, potentially um, low income communities, um, and, and I want to give credit to Chris, who sent this question in. Uh, so please jump in. Can I, can I offer that as long as technology keeps changing, we're going to have new divides. So one of the important pieces about the label is to be able to continuously keep it updated with the new broadband technologies, our new connection technologies, so that people can figure out what changes they need to make to adjust to new realities of how real, technology realities in terms of how we're using the technology, right? Our uses of it and what that those tools are, but then also the broadband technologies that bring this into our homes and into our lives, those are going to keep changing. So we may never solve the digital divide. We may come close on some divides, but then there's going to be new divides that develop. So it's really important for us to think about this label that can adjust with time so that we can always be trying to get trying to get ahead of it and we're not playing catch up as we are doing right now. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I hesitate um, to put, you know, uh, too many examples on the label as like what that benchmark should be. It, it needs to be flexible um, because um, <laughs> we saw, uh, you know, even in the context of education, um, the sort of the benchmarks, the tech specs for what you would need to be able to robustly access education from home jumped up dramatically over the course of the past two years. So um, understanding that there was more demand within the household for broadband service um, meant that, you know, if you have a family of four that's using broadband for work, for telemedicine, for um, remote education, for tutoring, you might need speeds around 200 MBS, Mbps down and 10 up or you know even more depending on what you're doing and how many people are in the household how many devices you've got um so it's just it's like it's it's just so critical to make sure that you have the capacity have a label that's going to meet be able to identify um, information that's going to be useful for current needs and then needs going forward as well and have the ability to evolve. That's why the, the, the label itself and earlier panels touched upon this needs to be digital. It needs to be a living document. So all the terms that, and hopefully it's not too many, but even the price, if you click on that, it's a live link that then goes to a place that breaks down all the fees, for example, or whatever download speed you click on download speed and that goes to an, a few frequently asked questions sort of resource i would imagine housed by the fcc that walks consumers through this is what this term is this is why this is important and then here's the tool for how much speed do you need that kind of thing i mean you know we've moved beyond window stickers and nutrition facts labels we can do this this isn't rocket science so I, that brings us close to the end of time. And I just want to throw out there quickly, if anybody's got a top three things that definitely have to be on this label, I mean, keeping in mind, we don't want to overwhelm consumers. Uh, what would be your top three? I'll give you um, my price transparency, number one. Yeah. I'd say um, the speeds, uh, making sure to break down speeds in a way that's meaningful. Um, so that you actually know what you're getting and how you can use it. Great. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time to be here today. Um, I think this has been a really important discussion and I, and I think overall today across all the, the roundtables, we've, we've been given a lot to think about. Uh, so 
I'd like to close out now that we've come to the end of time and, and just thank all of our roundtable participants across the, the various roundtables today and also my fellow moderators for sharing their time and expertise with us. Um, I want to thank a number of members of the FCC team that helped pull this event together, uh, Jeffrey Reardon and Steve Balderson of our Commission Meeting Room staff who handle the broadcast of events like this one on FCC.gov forward slash live, Zach Champ, Gerard Williams, Lyle Ishida, Christy Thornton, Mark Stone, Aaron Garza, Diana Coho, Renee Coles, and Rebecca Lockhart of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, who made today's hearing possible. Also like to thank everyone who tuned in today, and I'd like to remind you and encourage you to participate in this proceeding by submitting comments on the NPRM inside the FCC's electronic comment filing system. Uh, you can find a web link on the screen. It's fcc.gov forward slash ECFS forward slash filings forward slash express. And the docket number here is 22-2. You can also keep up to date on information related to the broadband consumer labels at fcc.gov forward slash broadband labels. We encourage you to continue to send questions to broadband labels hearing at fcc.gov. And please stay tuned for future announcements about upcoming hearings and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.